The idea of RS-485, particularly the Philips Dynalite implementation, is a multi-drop network. What that means is that any device can receive or transmit packets of data. It does so over a pair of cables and it's what's called a balanced data drive system. Standard data lighting that implements RS-485 protocol is DMX-512 and Dynet. It consists of a data plus and data minus cable twisted together as a pair with an overall shield. It's very popular as it is very reliable and robust and inexpensive to deploy. RS-485 is referred to as a transport layer and that defines the electrical signalling methodology of how it actually works. Protocol is what we send over that pair of wires. Dynet is a specific open protocol that's been developed by Philips Dynalite. It is a published protocol so anyone who needs to utilise it can get copies of what the packets are and actually adopt it. DMX512 is again a worldwide standardised protocol which is administrated by ESTA over in the States and is an entertainment lighting protocol designed for a centralised controller and many slave devices. So as much as it uses the same electrical standard, it's quite different in the way it is implemented. In some implementations, multiple protocols can be simultaneously used over CAT5. In some instances, you can ut utilise DMX and Dynet on the same conductor pairs, while you could have a device that, once it starts receiving a DMX512, it will obey it, but the rest of the time it is in Dynet mode. That is often done in performing arts centres. This diagram shows us how the data actually works. It shows you what sort of data packets are going down the D plus and D minus cable. The signal from D plus gets subtracted from D minus. It goes into the bus transceiver and comes out at twice the amplitude because you're effectively subtracting a negative sig signal. The beauty of this is that any noise that is induced into the cable gets subtracted out, which is the whole idea of a balanced line whether that be in audio or data implementation. Interestingly, Ethernet does exactly the same thing except it has a dedicated transmit and a dedicated receive pair. So to demonstrate this, here is a diagram on RS-485 in common noise rejection mode. This shows you the signals going down with noise induced, one out of phase with the other. Once it goes through the transceiver, the end result on a twisted pair cable is you get a nice clean signal. The idea being on the twisted pair cable that any noise is induced into one conductor is equally induced into the other conductor. If you use an untwisted cable such as a security cable, you will have different cable lengths in between the two and different lots of noise being induced into those two conductors. So when you do induce noise, the end result is after it's gone down the transceiver, you will still have a lot of noise which inherently mates for a bad network. That is why we use twisted pair networks. Layer and protocol. Let's have a look at the different protocols that Philips Dynalite offer. Dynet 1 has been around for over 20 years. It communicates at 9600 board and has a fixed 8 byte packet length. Typically these are the messages that are put out by any field control panels or any sensors. It's an open published protocol. Limitations are that there are a maximum of 255 areas and within each of those 255 areas there is a maximum of 255 channels. Although this may not sound like a whole lot, this is a huge number and we have been able to control many large museum spaces and large office buildings within the confines of that. Dynet 2. With the advent of a lot of large buildings in modern day, it has required the need for Dynet 2. Dynet 2 is basically a variable packet length for device configuration and large networks. Typically, the modern-day software applications that are used by Philips Dynalite use Dynet 2 as a way to upload and download data between the software and devices. Dynet 2 is also used in large network systems where we run a Dynet 2 backbone down the trunks of large buildings and then we run Dynet 1 spurs on a per-floor basis. 
This allows for a really good trunk and spur topology where we can put offsets on each floor and then have independent floor control but still global control from anywhere on the trunk. Under Dinette 2 we have a maximum of 65,000 areas and within each area we have a maximum of 65,000 logical control channels. This sort of implementation of controls has been used to control some of the world's biggest buildings. So far there have been no limitations found. One of the most important things, earlier we talked about the multi-drop part of RS-485. The most important things about the Philips Dynalight system is it uses distributed intelligence, which means there is no centralised controller. All the individual devices have their own smarts written into the devices. They all have their own individual microcontrollers. All of the intelligence is stored in each individual device. That means there is no reliance on one single part of the overall system. Therefore, if one part of the system fails, it will only take out that single device. Also, because it is a multi-drop type of control system, we can simply send out one message that is capable of doing system-wide changes with one single command. A good instance of that is a 37-storey tower in Melbourne running a Dynet 2 backbone with spurs running out onto each of those 37 floors. With one single message on Earth Hour, each year we can turn off the whole building within 50 milliseconds, which is pretty impressive.